今ご紹介いただきましたパリ大学のジョバンと申しますあの翻訳のため英語で発表させていただきますよろしくお願いします So this paper follows on a research that I started in Tomioka which is located near uh, Fukushima Daini nuclear plant um, a research that I started in 2002 uh, for nine months and the goal was to compare the working conditions in the nu Japanese nuclear plants uh, in France and Japan and to compare the health consequences of the exposure to radiation of those workers and the possible um, consequences of their health problem with the uh, safety of the nuclear plant. So I have already presented here and there this paper, so for those who have already listened to it, like uh, Kyle Cleveland and others, please apologize. Uh, but I, I slightly changed uh, many things, so I, I hope this will be a contribution to the panel of this morning on information. So here is the outline. In, I will, uh, the focus of this presentation is the part three on emanet, what I call emanetics of low doses. But uh, I will need before that to, to, to make some, uh, uh, to give you basic facts about the uh, working conditions in normal times, uh, the working conditions in nuclear plants in normal times. And then I would like to define what I call nuclear governance and the critique of the nuclear governance. And then I will come back on this point in the conclusion. So the first part about what I call the chronic dimension of nuclear disaster. Uh, you, you probably have seen similar pictures. This one is, is not very good quality. Uh, actually, it was provided by, uh, to me by uh, TEPCO, uh, Daini nuclear plant, uh, ten years ago. This is a picture of uh, the maintenance period. Uh, you know what we call in Japanese teikikensa, the periodic inspection. Uh, it is usually repair from one um, the maintenance of the plant is done at the time when they have to change the fuel rods. So they use this uh, uh, necessity to change the fuel rods to, to perform the maintenance of the nuclear plant. So those are some pictures. This is a picture of uh, an important pump for the cooling system. Um, uh, the pump of the cooling system is a decisive part of the reactor's safety. I wonder how it was when uh, Fukushima Daiichi has been hit by the earthquake and the tsunami. You know, in a nuclear plant you have many, many pumps and parts to, to check carefully and to change if necessary. Those are valves. And an important problem is that uh, you have to check carefully, but the the workers are exposed to, to radiation, so they, they have to do the job quickly. Um, otherwise, you have to increase the number of workers. So they have, this is this trade-off. You can't, you can't avoid this trade-off. And before, in the 1990s, the maintenance period used to be three months. So the workers had more time to conduct the task. But then, and one worker told to me that it was uh, influence from France, they had to change to reduce the time to three, uh, from three months to 45 days. So the workers had less time to conduct the task. And this could explain, to some extent, the weaknesses of, uh, the growing weaknesses of the nuclear plant, including Fukushima Daiichi. Um, so the nuclear plant workers, most, most of the workers who conduct the maintenance task are uh, subcontractors, as you know. But, and I think they do their best to answer the safety to conduct the task, but as they have to work quickly, um, they can't avoid a long exposure to radiation. 
Another problem is that their job is considered as a cost, a labor cost for TEPCO and other uh, electricity company. So this is why the maintenance period has been reduced. The charter, the cheaper, because as long as the maintenance period you stopped to produce electricity, so you reduce the, the, the profit you can make. So the shorter, the better. This worker shows me the health, um, the health document that he has falsified with a stamp that, he's ma that he made it himself. He has falsified this health document so has he can continue to, to perform, to go, to go inside Fukushima, Daiichi, and Daini. And not only for him, but also for his employees. It's a very small company. And at the time I met him, the reason why he agreed, he agreed to, to show me those documents is because he, he felt cheated by TEPCO. He had uh, diabetes. Uh, um, and, uh, well, actually, I was informed that he, made, he committed suicide uh, two years after we met. And, um, yeah, this is working conditions in normal times, so before the disaster. Although a cumulative dose of 5 millisieverts is enough to apply for compensation uh, as an occupational cancer, um, the number of, and despite the huge number of workers uh, in, employed in nuclear plants, for example, in 2009, the number of workers all over Japan was 80,000. Uh, the number of dues who have been who have applied and who have been recognized for occupational cancers is next, next to none, uh, only uh, uh, around 15 of them. Uh, a very few cases have been made public with the support of uh, some NGOs. So on this graph you can see the red part are, uh, uh, so this is from started in 1972 to up to 2009. The red part is the number of subcontractors, sub workers, and the blue bars are uh, regular employees from TEPCO and other electricity companies. So this shows you the, give you an idea of the average of subcontract workers versus regular employees. And now if you look at the uh, the total quantity of, of dose, uh, who is exposed to the bigger quantity of, of, of radiation? Shining guy, it's uh, contract workers. And uh, the regular employees, only a small part of it. So this is what I call the social invisibility of a chronic disaster, or the disaster before the disaster. I mean, here, by disaster, I. I, have in, I think we all have in mind 311, okay? So it is the disaster before 311, or the disaster before the disaster. So I guess all of you are familiar with those uh, pictures which, um, which show the disaster after the disaster. And after the disaster, we have seen a sort of uh, glorification, aerification of those workers. And, well, indeed, they were heroes. They've, been, they've done their best to avoid a bigger catastrophe, a bigger disaster for... Uh, and this is why we can be here in Tokyo today to, to, uh, to speak. Uh, otherwise, maybe Tokyo uh, would have been evacuated. So thanks them, uh, we are here uh, in Tokyo. Uh, so they have been brave indeed, and today, um, I mean, we have much less media reports on, on their working conditions, and I think most of them have been sacrificed. Um, those are also pictures you might have seen on uh, Japanese media and even in foreign medias of uh, those workers involved in the cleanup, not only of Fukushima Daiichi, but the uh, so-called decontamination work in Fukushima prefectures. Actually, uh, now in Fukushima Daiichi, we have less and less skilled workers, and most of them, uh, um, it's difficult to, to give an exact number, but uh, uh, many of them have been tr 
have transferred or they have been laid off. They have been laid out uh, from Fukushima Daiichi, and so they have uh, been looking for other jobs, and they are doing the decontamination work. So that problem is that the memory, the technical memory of Fukushima Daiichi is fading, and because of those skilled workers away from from the plants. Now I need to introduce um, two notions that I think will be helpful for the sociological analysis of the current situation. Um, the first one is the notion of governance and what I call nuclear governance. In the 1980s, uh, there was a lot of uh, discourse on good governance and governance has been promoted as a technocratic tool uh, a model of management uh, linked to the idea of the end of politics. Uh, this is not at all my meaning here. Um, the way I use no governance here is uh, follows on uh, Michel Foucault, the French philosopher Michel Foucault, um, which has developed a, a notion of gov govern governmentality. But this word is more difficult to pronounce in English, so. <laughs> and Foucault himself used to uh, also use the notion of governance. So the way I use it is here is uh, follows on Foucault is is critical approach of uh, political power and the way uh, political powers uh, interferes with life, the politics of life, what he calls biopower. Now the next notion is notion of critique. Uh, well, n of course, in the average sense of critique, uh, to critique something. But the way I use here it follows on the, uh, the work of French sociologist Luc Boltanski, a professor of sociology. Actually, he was invited uh, as a keynote speaker at the World Congress of Sociology this year, and he made an impressive talk. He has developed what he calls the sociology of the critique. And compared to his professor, who was Pierre Bourdieu, uh, Bourdieu used to make the critical sociology. And Boltanski has transferred the focus of sociology on the description of how the actors, like, uh, like you actually, you, the fact that you are here today perhaps is a, is a sign that you, you are inclined to make a critique of the nuclear governance. So my role as a sociologist would be to observe you. <laughs> So that's strange that I'm here. Maybe I, you should be here, and I'm should be, I should be there. But anyhow. Um, so the notion of nuclear governance is a mix of institutions which make use of nuclear technology as a means to, what they would say is, as a means to assure energy security. In many cases, the motivations are also military, but that's taboo, okay? So we can't talk about this. But um, though it may involve, the, so the nuclear go governance may involve commingling between the plant operators and the regulation authorities, it cannot, I think it cannot be reduced to a lobby, uh, the so-called nuclear lobby, or the nuclear village. Or maybe when you look at some actors, I would be tempted to say that's nuclear mafia. Uh, and in some cases, do those terms, those namings are okay. But I think for other, for other members of this nuclear governance, it would m not be appropriate. I will develop on this later. But um, so that's why I, I propose this more neutral way of naming the nuclear mafia, the nuclear village. And on the part of the critique, uh, you have uh, many NGOs. Some of them existed before 311, some of them appeared after 311, like this uh, conference. Uh, the fact important for me regarding nuclear workers is that you have no big unions. You know Japanese Rengo, one of the a biggest uh, trade uh, union confederation in the world, they are they they are not involved in the negotiation with the ministry and so on. So those are uh, negotiations that have been uh, 
launched by very small, uh, not labor, well, labor unions, but what I call labor NGOs. This is uh, NGOs who, are, who care about working conditions, who care about the, the fake, the situation of uh, um, workers who do not have voice in the big unions, okay? So those groups have launched us, uh, many negotiations, meetings with the Ministry of Health and Labor, mainly, uh, but also um, Ministry of Economy. Actually, m most all the ministries related to uh, 311 disaster will come to these meetings. And what struck me when I, I look at the way they interact with the governments is that they, they bring, these guys are, or girls, <laughs> are the ones who bring fresh information of what is going on at Fukushima Daiichi. They know much, much more about the situation in Fukushima Daiichi than the government's employees do. <laughs> and most of the time, the government employees will say, oh, honto desu ka? They are surprised. <laughs> Uh, they are surprised or they fake to be surprised. <laughs> That's, maybe it's ambiguous sometimes. And so those labor activists, are, they, they ask very harsh questions and they are making a very, they are developing a very rational critique of the current situation and they put pressure on the government to make some implementation, some improvement of the current situation. This is the way they interact, <laughs> okay. And another striking point is that, you know, they are very small groups, but if they write letters to TEPCO, well, they got answers. That's very interesting, right? This is TEPCO, and those are those very small groups, okay? <laughs> there is a disproportion of forces, right? But despite that, they, they got, they can get answers. Very impressive. Okay. On what is the topic of this conference? The radiation protection. The activists contest that there is so far no health follow-up to workers exposed to a cumulative dose below 50 millisievert for external radiation exposure. Another point is that there is so far no records, and that's, that's a decision of, from TEPCO and the ministry, that there will be no records for internal radiation below 2 millisievert. Very shocking point. So far, there is no systematic dosimetry, no health follow-ups for the people employed in the decontamination work on the hotspots of Fukushima Prefecture. And that's another big, big part of the problem. Activists also claim that workers should be given the right of an access to the epidemiological survey planned by TEPCO and the Ministry of Health and Labor on a huge course of uh, 20,000 workers. And the pro another problem of this survey that it has been limited on purpose by the ministry to the workers who have been employed at Fukushima Daiichi from March 11 to December 2011. It means that they won't care about the workers who have been employed there afterwards, which is another problem. So the question, the way uh, do surveys are being conducted. They, they question the production of knowledge on radiation regarding the workers. And here I will quote uh, Professor Matsumoto from uh, Matsumoto Miwao, who has written a book in Japanese, very interesting, called Structural Disaster, Kozo Ozai. And he said, accumulating wrong data will aggravate the structural disaster on the long haul. So I think these act, labor activists are doing a very important job so that we will not accumulate wrong data. Now let's go to the main part, uh, what I call the hermeneutics. So th the nuclear governance and its critique disagree not necessarily on the purpose of conducting of conducting surveys, epidemiological, epidemiological surveys mainly. The risk is that cleanup workers and Fukushima citizens may be used as guinea pigs. 
And this is why they want to keep an eye on the method, the purpose, the kind of data collected. When the surveys have been conducted and the results published come to the time of the discussion on the interpretation of these results. And this is uh, the philosophers uh, call the interpretation task, they call that hermeneutics. It is the, the science of interpreting documents, um, all sort of knowledge. So regarding the discussion and conflicts of interpretations, the hermeneutics of radiation protection on low doses, the question might be, to what extent has 311 has created a new context that could lead to the further modification of current standards of radio protection? What will be the specific role of epidemiological research on nuclear plant workers? And of course, the influence of those surveys for the average citizen. So, you know this Professor Yamashita Shinichi, don't you? And uh, you know his famous uh, slogan, okay? Below 100 millisievert, there is no worry. No need to worry, okay? And you know the reaction of many of you? And Now, I think, well, this is a controversy, okay? And this is one-to-one, -one, okay? Looks like fair deal. Like you have one say see this, and the other one say no. So it looks like a equal controversy. Actually, the controversy is nourished by a lot of foreign ex experts. And this conference is part of the whole thing. <laughs> So you have the experts from ICRP, IEA, WHO, etc. And you have also, uh, maybe you you can recognize Professor Michel Fernex and the friend from France, Krihad. Professor Bavastok, who is here. <laughs> and so on. I think CSRP is part of the whole thing, okay? The question is, your understanding of the situation is it like this? For example, is it like uh, the voice of the nuclear governance is much stronger than the voice of the critique? Or is it rather like this? Like, uh, oh, sorry. So, so is it like this? Like the voice of the, of the nuclear governance is stronger? Or is it, or is it like this? The, the voice of the critique is stronger. OK, you got it? Wow. Now, and this is one reason why I prefer to talk of nuclear governance instead of nuclear uh, lobby. Um, it, one reason is that within the nuclear establishment, within the nuclear, the Genpatsumura, you have people like Professor uh, uh, Toshito Kosako, uh, we made a declaration, we made a, a statement about how dangerous our an exposure is uh, uh, to uh, 20 millisievert a year. And interesting point for uh, regarding nuclear plant workers that he made a comparison with this average of exposure to the current, uh, to the average citizen and the children. He made a comparison with this level of exposure with the current level of exposure of uh, nuclear plant workers or ur uranium mines. And if, uh, if you look at the data before 311, you will see that is right. I mean, only a very few a number of, a uh, very small number of workers have been exposed to um, uh, doses, uh, your doses of 20 millisieverts. Actually, even in Fukushima Daiichi, which is one of the most, uh, which was one of the most uh, contaminated uh, because very old plant, uh, you had 
I mean, officially, you had no worker who have been exposed to 20 millisievert uh, before the disaster. Of course, after that, it changed. But so the fact is that now in Fukushima, children uh, in Fukushima now children wear film badges um, and dosimeters, just like NPP workers. The city clocks give not only time. Uh, city clock, uh, uh, the city clock gives not only time but also the background radiation level. The citizens are asked to manage their radiation protection. Uh, Fukushima Prefecture has become a vast controlled zone. Kanikuiki is the, 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 the way to, to name uh, the most the part of the nuclear plant which is most exposed to radiation, okay? So Fukushima has become a, a control zone while the rest of Japan is more or less out of control. What a crazy situation. But there is a risk of that we get used to this situ situation. And this is where we need artists. <laughs> Artist, may, uh, artist, film, film uh, uh, conductor will provoke us to look at reality differently. Actually, this movie, um, I guess you have seen it, is, uh, um, I think it plays with the fact that women have been criticized uh, as hysteric. Uh, the, you know, the women, they don't know about these uh, complicated things like radiation. They are, his they are crazy and, and so on. And also, it's a way to uh, draw the attention on this, uh, uh, this discourse by the nuclear governance on radiophobia, resilience, and so on and so on. Um, you know that Professor Shi uh, Shigenobu, uh, Nagataki Shi uh, Shigenobu Nagataki has expressed publicly views that are not far from the views of Professor Yamashita Shunichi. Actually, Yamashi, Yamashita san is the uh, was say student of Professor Nagataki, or did have this kind of relation. Uh, I had an occasion to meet him, and I asked him his opinion on the statement by Professor Kosako, uh, the, the statement that Professor Kosako made on April 2001, and he said. Oh, well, you know, Professor Kosako regrets his statement, the statement about the 20 millisievert uh, level dose exposure. So, well, I, have, uh, I wanted to check with Professor Kosako himself, so I visited him, and, and he said, no, absolutely no regret. So, well, this shows one thing, that this guy is a true liar, okay? <laughs> and second thing, uh, so this is more complicated with Professor Kosako, but let me do it shortly. I mean, we can discuss later. Um, another thing when I visited Professor Nagataki is that he made also harsh, criticize, uh, harsh critiques on Professor Elizabeth Cardiz. Um, She has been the head of the Department of Radiation Health Effects at AARC. In you know, it's the research uh, center on cancers uh, located in in France, but it's part of WHO. And well, one of her ma major contribution of Professor Cardis was her direction of large survey on NPP workers. Uh, it's a very huge survey on. 15 countries, and she was the head of this program. The, resul the results were published in the several articles, and a, a particularly groundbreaking one was published in the British Medical Journal in 2005, and it showed slight, slight increase of cancer mortality for workers with cumulative dose of 100 millisievert. But only a slight increase, and uh, the conclusion of this article did not recommend a change of the current standards of radio protection. So, for early, I'm sociologist, I'm, I'm a 
So those things, I have difficulties to understand those papers, okay? but I do my best, thank you. So, but for a layman like me, I thought this paper wasn't a big deal. So I thought, what's wrong with Professor uh, Nagataki? Why, why is he so critical of this, of this survey? And it took me time to understand that for him, this slight increase of cell mortality was too, just too much. <laughs> he couldn't afford it. He couldn't bear it. So I asked Professor Cardis an interview. And she kindly explained, and so I visited her, and she's now located in, in a research center in Spain. And she kindly explained to me the limitations of the epidemiological methodology. I mean, that's a thing we can discuss later. We, perhaps Professor Bavesto can help us to understand this. But epidemiology has intrinsic uh, uh, methodological constraints. And for example, um, an important one is what, what statistician, statisticians and epidemiologists call the confidence intervals. And, well, it's kind of a joke, but I, I would say epidemiologists believe in confidence intervals. I don't know how far Professor Verstock and other epidemiologists believe to this, but um, that's the point. We cannot ignore. Okay. And Another point is uh, Professor Cardis has also participated in the, I guess many of you know uh, this report, uh, I think there is a Japanese translation now, um, the famous so-called definitive reports on Chernobyl. Okay, Actually, Professor Yamashita Shunichi was also co-author of this report. And in the frame of an interview, I understood that she has been in a very tricky situation that she had to present this report in Geneva. But on the previous day, IEAA made a presentation of this, of this report. And they, you know, they presented this report their own way, in a way that will reduce the communication uh, the risk communication. <laughs> That's risk com communication. But is that risk communication or is that uh, uh, marketing and marketing lies? That's the trick. So I think she has been cheated on this. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I'd be glad to to hear uh, Professor Baverstock as. Uh, used to work with Professor Cardis uh, years ago, so maybe she, um, I think he can have some interesting comment on this. Uh, by the way, uh, you, Professor Nagataki, uh, that this was in last August in Japan. There was a conference on uh, forgot, uh, but it was in Japan, and Professor Nagataki was there, and he was contested during this conference with the government. And actually, Professor Tsuda was there also. Is, are you here, Professor Tsuda? Ah, Tsuda sensei, Mada Kitinai in this. Ah, yeah, ma. Ah, Mada Inai ka. Well, but I know he was there, so uh, maybe uh, he will uh, comment on this also. Conclusion Where exactly is the critique? At what step is it? And what are its effects? So, I will give you a, now a, a, cart a cartography of the flows of critique. Who criticizes who and for what reason? Now, I cannot go too f in the details of for what reason, but just to give you a flows of the critique. So we have seen, we have, I will I make a distinction between the nuclear governance and the, nu the critique of the nuclear governance, or what we can call the nuclear critique. So we have seen Professor. Uh, Yamashita, the uh, IEA, Professor Nagataki, uh, well, I would put the Prime Minister there. Oh, this is what we call, so far we could call this the nuclear mafia, okay? <laughs> I would be okay with that. But I would be uncomfortable to wrench Professor Kosako within a nuclear mafia. I don't think he's, he's, uh, he's it's just not his type, okay? 
and neither Professor Cardi's. Um, she, she, uh, it doesn't uh, match her, her, her. So this is why I would prefer the more neutral term of nuclear governance to define this, this group. And they have connections. Professor Bavestock used to be on that side, nuclear governance, but for some reasons that he has explained already, he has tended to shift it uh, 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 toward the nuclear critique. Uh, Matsuda san, Tsuda sensei, I think I would, we can put Professor Tsuda here, and so on. I go quickly, Professor Koide san, Iwata san, Tachi, and Ishimaru Koshiro was among the rare nuclear op uh, opponents to the uh, nuclear plants in, in Fukushima uh, Daiichi, Daini, uh, before 311, and now he lives in Iwaki. Oh, here you have the politicians huh? from Shaminto, the Social Democrat Party, and the uh, Communist Party is uh, a representative in Iwaki City of the Communist Party. Both of them are very committed for the situation of the nuclear plant workers and, of course, the situation after 311. So here you have the politics. Oh, over there also. But here, the politics uh, on the critical side, okay? And Yamamoto Taro. And, well, Koizumi and Hosokawa, they used to be over there <laughs> and then shifted here, there, okay? Now let's see the, the flows of the critique. The CSRP will criticize the nuclear governance, okay? But also, yeah, I guess they are critique of, I mean, I guess mainly they don't care about you, but uh, just. And you have also these flows of critique. We have seen that Professor Kosako was critic, uh, critical about the decision made by those guys over there. And well, you can have also these flows. Oh, sorry. These flows of critique. And also within the critique, within the critique, nuclear critique, you have a lot of uh, criticism of each other. For example, f that's for historical reason. The Social Democratic Party used to be the, the Socialist Party, has complicated relation with the Communist Party. For you would say, oh, they are all left leftist, but no, for them they are. They have different uh, uh, political tradition, way of uh, um, or or organizing themselves and expressing themselves. So, and I guess also among the nuclear, op the opponents to nuclear energy, the uh, all those who are critical to the current situation of uh, radiation protection. So on. you have so many um, different views, and people will. Critis will be uh, critis critical to each other, okay? And, well, this is also what we call debate, controversy. So, let me conclude the conclusion with this remark. As my professor of, um, Boltonski has, uh, um, in his book On the Critique, has argued, the role of the institution is to assess the real. It means um, to repeat again and again what things really are and how we should interpret science and turn it into policies. Then comes the critique to challenge this version. Oh, you say things are like this, but come on, is it really what you say? So the, the, critical, the critique will question the reality of what it is. Is it really what you say? Okay. So the, the critique, the role of the critique is to reopen other possible outcomes. Does science really say so? If science doesn't really say so, you cannot deduct these policies. So I hope this fourth session of the CSRP will once again reopen the possible outcomes and the interpretations on low doses radiation and their health effects.
Now, as this first panel is about information, let me uh, finish by an information. Um, on December 15, on the coming December 15, there will be an, uh, a conference organized by the nuclear governance. And uh, it will be about low doses. So it might be interesting. So if some of you could attend, I must have won't be in Japan, so I hope some of you can attend take some record, or even if you can put on the video on the web, that would be very nice. I would be appreciate. I would appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much. Domo, ご清聴ありがとうございました.